So I'd like to start again by thanking the organizers, Jan, Yang, and uh, Lucas for organizing this workshop and also for inviting me to my work. I've been great so far. Uh, I'm going to talk about circular photocurrents. It's great that I get to talk now after half of the workshop is done because uh, many of these things have been mentioned already. Like so many things have been mentioned that I feel like <laughs> I, uh, More coffee break. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there will be some stuff that hasn't been uh, mentioned. Uh, we have a new paper. So the, the old paper with the quantization prediction is this one. Uh, we have a new paper with a slightly different perspective on how to measure this, which is on difference frequency generation. I'll be talking about this and I'm comparing two approaches. So I, I want to uh, go a little bit deeper into the theory of how things work and what are the conditions uh, to what, uh, uh, Measure this experimentally. Uh, the idea is to bring this prediction as close to experiment as possible to see if it can be realized. Uh, and also, towards the end of the talk, I will also mention uh, uh, that there are, in fact, two contributions to the circular particle band capacity metals. There's an interband and an intraband or precarrier contribution that we didn't mention in the first paper. Uh, so, there's some interesting stuff in this uh, precarrier contribution as well. So, Talk will be first part about the interband and then a little bit of uh, recovery at the end. Uh, so, while semi-metals don't uh, need an introduction, probably in, in this crowd, so uh, I think Barry did a very nice job at the beginning uh, introducing them. So, for my talk, what's important is uh, a vile semi-metal is any band structure that, or any material featuring uh, vile points in the band structure. Uh, vile points are uh, two full crossings of. of Band energies where uh, at <clears throat> low energy the Hamiltonian is, is the Weil Hamiltonian that is the Weil points. Uh, they uh, are characterized by being monopoles of the very curvature, so they're sources and sinks of, of very curvatures, which uh, are on the nodes uh, like this. And so they are topological in the sense that if you uh, have if you build a surface around the node in, in momentum space and integrate the very curvature because it's a monopole, the flux of the monopole to the sphere is quantized. So there's an integer that characterizes uh, five point this. So it's topological in a sense that is different from topological insulator. It's more like a local invariant in momentum space, but it's still quantized. And so one can think uh, in the same sense as in the Hall effect one can measure the topological invariant of this state by uh, measuring the whole conductance. So one to one correspondence between uh, whole conductance and uh, the chair number, the TKNN invariant. One may ask, can we do something similar or uh, related for a metallic system, which does not have a gap, so uh, the whole conductivity is in principle not uh, protected, that there, there might be something else that is quantized and that measures exactly the topological invariant. And as you know from several of the previous talks, uh, we had this prediction that indeed there is the case that, that one can uh, measure the turn number of the file point in an experiment, and the type of experiment you do is uh, circular photocurrent. <coughs> measure a circular photocurrent. So this is the, the, the punchline of, of the experiment. You shine circularly polarized light, and this produces a current, and this current in the simplest expression or in the simplest model looks like this. Uh, this is the degree of circular polarization of the current. So this is the imaginary part of uh, E of omega. And the coefficient here is quantized in terms of fundamental constants only, the same thing as, as in the whole effect. So there's P, E, cubed, and H squared. And the coefficient here is the chair number of the node. Okay? So there's a way of making the chair number by, by doing this type of experiment. Note here, I wrote a DTJ, so this is not really a current, it's the derivative of the current with respect to time that's So it's uh, a little bit different. And so what I want to do now is explain how, how does this work, uh, how do we get it, how can we measure it, okay? So <clears throat> the difference uh, in this talk, what's new that is in this new paper I was mentioning, it is it's a different perspective to look at photocurrents, which is slightly different, so I'm going to try to connect these two. This, this new perspective or this new type of experiment is uh, difference frequency generation, which is also a nonlinear effect, it's a bit more general. What you do now is you shine two uh, beams with uh, frequencies omega 1 and omega 2, uh, and you still produce a current. Now the frequencies are different, so you, uh, usually for any nonlinear effect, <coughs> out, output current is uh, occurs at the sum of the frequencies that uh, you shine. So for, uh, 
nonlinear process are two, a second order, this is a general expression that one has. Uh, you, because uh, this has both plus and minus omegas, you get both uh, frequency sum and frequency difference generation. I'm interested in frequency difference when the detuning is very small. So I take omega 1 and omega 2 as omega plus minus some very small uh, detuning. Now I expand this uh, function in the detuning parameter. And the resulting expression of what gets uh, looks like this. Okay? Uh, so this is very similar to the, to the orogalvanic effect. In fact, I will connect uh, in a minute. But you see that there are two contributions to the uh, current that one makes. One is uh, response to the circular light origin uh, only, and so it has circular origin, and is proportional to sine of delta omega t, whereas the one that goes with linear polarization, which is this here, goes with cosine omega t. Okay? And so the, uh, what I've been calling the uh, for galvanic effect is the limit of this effect when the detuning goes to zero. When the detuning goes to zero, these two fields are the same, and you're really shining just one light and, and collecting the current. And then this uh, crosses over to the photocarbonic. And so for the linear part, you can see there's no problem in letting delta omega go, go to zero. This just becomes one. And this tensor here is the same tensor that one computes in the linear photocarbonic. But in the injection current, you can see something a little bit funny happens, because if I let delta omega go to zero, I get a t here. Right? So the sign at a low, a small argument is delta omega t, the delta omega cancels. So this becomes a current that apparently grows linearly in time. Okay, so this is an injection current. There's a more formal way of, of doing this. But if, if you just shine light and you have no dissipation, this is like the intrinsic process only, the, the current just grows linearly in time for it. Okay, and this is called an injection current. So in that sense, difference frequency generation is a way of regularizing this that, that you know, makes more sense that you can, you can keep shining light forever and it just oscillates with, with the sun at finite frequency difference. And in fact, this, this is an experiment that's probably hard to make, but conceptually, it helps to do this calculation and to think about this problem in a way that is free of, of uh, ambiguity. Okay? So the uh, hypotheses that we use to derive this are, first of all, this is in the clean limit, so tau is formally infinity, the scattering time, so there's, there's no scattering, so dissipation. Uh, this simple equation uh, is only for the case of time reversal symmetry. If you break time reversal, there are more terms. And for now, I am only considering interband transitions, so there's no Fermi surface. Even though while semi-metals always have a Fermi surface, but let me focus on interband pieces for now. And as I was saying, when delta goes to zero, this is the this is for the line. Okay. So in this way, I can, uh, this, this will be uh, the next slide, actually. So how, how do you measure uh, different <coughs> frequency generation? Uh, this is also a, a way of, of clarifying how you so if you have a current that oscillates in time now, because the detuning is, is finite, uh, a current that oscillates in time uh, radiates. So you, can, uh, you don't need to collect the current in contacts anymore. You can measure the emitted uh, terahertz field, which is this E out. And because of Maxwell's equations, if you have a current that oscillates, this E out is just proportional to the derivative of the current. And of course, that's delta omega. So this is another way of distinguishing between injection and shift currents, if you shine a uh, light that goes like this, then for the injection current for circular light, uh, you get something that oscillates with the cosine of delta omega, the derivative of this, whereas for shift, we get something that oscillates with the sine. Okay. That's uh, another way of seeing it. And this should be compared with the uh, DC photocurrent, which is the limit when delta omega is zero. Uh, so if delta omega is zero, tau it's going to be larger than this, so you're in the opposite regime, which is the uh, one that is ordered regime, uh, where, where tau matters. And so now it, it matters whether uh, you, you're at short times or at long times compared to tau. At short times, as I said before, you get a current that grows linearly in time. But uh, because now this is really DC, at some point, the current has to saturate. So if you have some dissipation mechanism, the current doesn't grow forever, but it saturates at some finite uh, value, which is proportional to tau. So this was our original prediction in the Nature Communications paper. And it has a problem that, you know, it has a tau sitting in front of it. And uh, it, that's non-universal. That depends on details of uh, the, the crystal or on, on the disorder potential in the crystal. And so 
the effect is not really quantized in this region. You need to find a way of dividing by tau to have something uh, properly quantized. And so what we said is, well, don't be in this regime, just uh, measure this current really fast before it saturates and then you're good. Of course, that's really hard. A better way of thinking about this is uh, do the difference frequency generation where the beating is much faster than tau. So if you can achieve this, then you, you can distinguish between sine and cosine and then picking out the cosine contribution is uh, quantized and has no tau. Okay, so that's the new insight in, in the difference frequency generation paper. Okay, so uh, this is general. I mean, this is not Bilsen metal, just theory of uh, photocurrents. Now, uh, why is this quantized in a Bilsen metal in particular? <coughs> so for that, I need uh, to show you a few lines of calculation for this beta coefficient. Sorry. So beta is uh, this guy here, right? So I'm going to take the trace of beta because it, this is uh, a simple calculation and it's essentially what is quantized in the end. So trace of beta means you shine light and you measure the, the longitudinal current in the direction of the uh, applied light, and then you average over three directions. You do x, y, and c, and that's, that's the trace of this uh, <clears throat> So that formula for beta is uh, written here. It has a simple interpretation in, in terms of Fermi the rule. So what, what's happening here is you have a resonant process between an occupied and unoccupied band. Uh, so you have some rate of excitation of electron hole pairs. That's given by the optical matrix element R. So this is just R, the, the coupling to the electric field squared, the, the optical matrix element. So you have a rate of creation of electron hole pairs, and then these electron hole pairs carry a current, which is given by this term here. So the derivative of E is the velocity, and this is the difference in velocities between electrons and holes. So you average this velocity with the uh, probability of excitation of electron hole pairs over the brilliant zone, and that gives you the photocurrent. Okay? And because this is a rate, this is also a rate of growth of current. It's not a constant current, but a rate of growth. Okay? That's why it's a DTJ. Okay? And so if you look at this uh, equation for a minute, you see uh, there's this delta function here uh, picking up the resonant manifold, we call it. So the uh, set of points in momentum space in K where you have a transition connected exactly by frequency omega. This defines a surface in, in momentum space. And you also have here uh, the derivative of the same quantity uh, that you have here as a function of momentum, right? So for, for that particular surface I defined, the decay of this quantity is the normal to this surface. Okay? It's the place where uh, it, it, the, <clears throat> the surface is like this, the derivative is, is the maximum uh, gradient, which is the normal uh, to the surface. And so this quantity here can really be written as just the flux of this optical matrix element through the surface that I just Okay, so this is a very simple way of writing this photogalvanic uh, current, and, uh, and that's all really. So now, the one thing that I need to relate to Berry curvature is that this optical matrix element has the following sum rule for, for the Berry curvature. So Berry curvature of band N is obtained by summing R over the other index, or M. Uh, but now let's assume that the frequency is very small so that all the other bands that are not forming the vinyl node are very far in energy so that I can pretend that this is a two-band model, in which case I don't have a sum, I just have R12, the matrix element for this particular transition. And then R12 is essentially very curved. Okay? And if that happens, then in this formula here, I just have flux of very curvature through this uh, surface that I defined. And as I was saying at the beginning, the flux of very curvature is quantized over the vinyl point. And so you just get the churn number and this beta coefficient that I was mentioning. Okay. So if you have a two-band model, circular photogalvanic effect is quantized. What happens if the other bands are not so far away? Then uh, this optical matrix element gets a correction. So now you just use this formula in reverse. So you solve for R12, and you find that there's an R13 as well. And so that also goes in here and uh, screws up the quantization. But you can estimate uh, how large is this R compared to omega, and you get this, this type of expression. So you see but at low energies, is E3 is the energy of the faraway band. The energy of this process is much smaller than E3, meaning the bands are far away. Then this decays like omega squared, and you can essentially throw it away. So there is a correction to quantization from higher bands. You're really probing the vial point at low energies. This doesn't matter. This is the sense in which the circular photogalvanic effect is quantized. It's quantized when you're close to the node and nothing. So 
So this was the original prediction from the nature communications paper. You can try now how this works in, in a Tuban model. There's one thing, if you've been in this field long enough, you immediately wonder, okay, you're measuring the Chern number, but I already know that in the brilliant zone, there must be an equal number of left and right nodes. So if I try this process for left and right nodes, it's going to give me the sum of opposite Chern numbers and it's going to cancel, and that is right. For example, if you have a mirror symmetry that relates uh, left and right nodes at the same energy, then this effect has to cancel exactly. So what you need is that uh, nodes of uh, left and right nodes are not exactly at uh, the same energy, and this does not have to happen in a system with no mirrors, okay? So if you take a chiral system, where the <coughs> lattice where the Weizmann metal is realized is chiral, it has no orientation reversing operation. Then the vial points can be at any energy, and you may find a situation where one of the vial points is fully blocked, so this transition doesn't happen, but the other one does, and so it's in that case where you can get a plateau. Now, in the integral of the full brilliance. Okay, so for example, if you take this band structure here and you take the chemical potential very near the node, let's say the green line, once you can make transition from here to here, you get something quantized all the way until the other node comes in and then it dies. Okay, so the chemical potential of the nodes matter because you need to poly block one but not the other one. So if you, if you poly block both, it's zero. If both are uh, active, it's also zero. So you need to find an energy window in between where the effect is quantized. Okay? And so the critical thing here is to find a vial semi-metal that's realized in a chiral uh, lattice structure. And, you know, Tantalomar's Nick, the famous one, doesn't work. And in fact, we don't really have uh, candidates for vial semi-metals in chiral structures. This is uh, the only one that has been predicted that would work, but. Uh, this one that, that doesn't really grow, that there have been no experiments uh, since the prediction. But we can use it as an example to see how, uh, how you know, the energy scale would work. So this is the band structure, it has nodes at different energies. This is neglecting spin orbit coupling, which is a good uh, function for this material. So you have nodes that are separated by about 150 milli electron volts. And so if the frequency is uh, much or it's smaller than this, then you're activating this node but not the other one. Uh, so if omega is less than this energy, uh, but larger than one with the scattering rate, which let, let's say it's almost infinite, uh, then there's a frequency region where you can observe quantization. Uh, if you put numbers in, well, I'm taking lifetimes from Tantalo Marsnik from this paper, but uh, this is a big issue because you really need to know what tau is. But if you have a scattering rate of 4 milli electron volts between 4 and 150, you should have a window where you can measure the effect. Okay, and so if you want to know the number uh, that you get from this combination of fundamental constants, you can write it like this. You can replace the electric field uh, by the intensity of the light, and then you put it back in the equation, and you do this directional average that I was mentioning. And what you get is 22.2 amps per watt per picosecond. Here times the intensity, so the effect is, is linear. And, uh, so this is not just amps per watt, do you remember? Because this is a rate of growth of the current. It's not just we either need to measure the slope, or stick a tau in, or do different frequency, all of these options that I was mentioning. Okay, so this is uh, how it would work in this uh, strontium disilicide, which uh, does not exist. Uh, four years later, uh, this material doesn't really grow, and we don't really have any other good candidates. An engineering one is hard because vial points are, in principle, accidental. They can occur anywhere in the uh, brilliant zone, and there's no way to predict uh, where they're going to end in general. So there's one case where we know how to make it work uh, in tidal crystals, which is a trip. You have a, you know, all with spin orbit coupling, all two hole crossings in trims in uh, tidal crystals have to be vial premium. And because they're chiral, they're not related to any other, so they can sit anywhere in the brilliant zone. And this, this would be a very nice design principle to try to look for a material that works. And this paper actually did a really good job in, in enumerating many, many candidates. But the problem is the splitting, because this is a spin orbit coupling effect, the splitting is very small. So the range in frequency where you could probe the effect is, is not really uh, not really used. So, so the uh, bands for this case more or less look like this, right? So there's some type of brush bus splitting, but in three dimensions, and you want to make transitions like this. But this range is, is the energy is the energy scale of spin orbit coupling, which is small. Ideally, I want to have something big, like you know, like 
this material. Uh, this thin orbit won't get you this. So, uh, so we don't have anything so far. Uh, so there was another option when we were writing the paper, uh, which was uh, these higher order uh, nodal crossings, which have more than two bands. We actually had a referee ask, asking this question, uh, does this effect work for the uh, multifolds? And uh, so if you read the paper, you'll find we said no. This, this was me answering the referee and saying, you know, this thing is not expected to work because essentially if you take this correction I was mentioning before, this E3, the, the band that is far away, is crossing the node, so this E3 is zero. Okay, so this, this correction blows up and it doesn't make sense. This will never be one. So this is what I answered to the referee and moved on and I tried to design a valve semi-metal in some other way. And then we found this, which came out a year later, which is uh, another prediction for, for the multifolds that wasn't in the previous paper by uh, Barry and co-workers. And they were not only predicting the band structure, but they tried the photocurrent calculation as well, and they found it's quantized at four because these uh, nodes effectively have chair number four. Okay, and so I went back to this and I said, how does this work? And I was a bit puzzled for a while, but we thought, okay, let's go back to the blackboard and see, and see what happened here, because in principle it should not work. Uh, but we were motivated to do it because, you know, we thought this, this might really exist, this, uh, this might uh, be the only candidate that we have. And, and, and really that's the case. So uh, as, as you know, we've seen throughout the uh, workshop in, in several talks, there are now uh, a set of materials in, in Space Group 198 with the same structure that featured this, this triple crossing with chair number four, uh, cobalt silicide and also aluminum platinum as Neil was uh, mentioning. Uh, the spin orbit coupling in these compounds is small in all of them and uh, you saw in Nils's talk that uh, you have to work really hard to resolve the splitting he has done it so now we know that the chair number is really four uh, but uh, for what i'm going to do I'm, I'm, I'm still going to assume that there is essentially no spin orbit coupling here then i can tell what happens when, when you add it okay but the material is there now uh, so let's see what happens with quantization does it really work and so we were looking at this for a while, and it turns out it works, but it's a very, it's kind of a fine-tuned thing. What happens is, uh, now you have three bands, right? So uh, you can have two types of transitions. Let's say chemical potential is above the node. So you can have the one, two transition. Let's say these are bands one, two, three. This is the one, three transition. Here it's blocked. Higher energies, you can have both transitions. So now it depends. You have to compute uh, both of them separately. In general, you have the flux of R2 through the surface and the flux of R3. So let's say I try to force this guy to be very curvature. So I can replace it by omega 1, but then I get one correction, which is this uh, R13, as, as, as it happened before. But now the trick is I also have the 1 3 transition. This wasn't active in the previous case because the third band was really far away. Now it's not far, it's here. And if you write it like this, this is very suggestive, right? So it's actually the same matrix element and the flux is through two different surfaces. And now comes the trick, which is in a linear model, you can prove, uh, and uh, thanks to Barry, we were working this uh, together and he had, he had this insight that when this is linear, then you can prove that this flux is essentially the same for both surfaces and it goes to zero, the correction. Okay, so in a linear model, when the dispersion is linear, all this goes away, and then you end up having the flux of the recapture. And so it's quantized. Okay, so in the previous paper, they showed this plot, but they didn't really show why it was quantized, or they didn't do the fine, uh, the fine detail of what happens in here. Uh, in fact, depending on, on the type of transition that you have, you may have a plateau that is not quantized. Okay, uh, see, if you only have the S12, you don't cancel this correction, and you have another plateau somewhere which is flat because the model is linear, there's no energy scale, but it is not quantized. So you need to go to the right range where all the transitions conspire so that this cancellation occurs. So we proved this also for three folds, four folds, six folds for all the classification. Okay, so there's always one window in somewhere, uh, or at least there can always be a window where the quantization happens, and it's exactly quantized in the linear. If the model is not linear, then it doesn't happen. Then there are corrections, okay, in addition to everything else. Okay. So in principle, uh, what also works, okay? Or, or all the, you know, the 198 code. 
So throughout the talk, I've been saying many times, this only works if this happens, if that happens, if this energy is larger than this. So let me uh, show a summary of everything that has to happen so that you can measure uh, the quantized uh, for the body. So first of all, you need to be in the regime where uh, we call it the clean or, or the fast regime, where DTJ is independent of tau. So tau is so large that essentially it doesn't matter. Uh, you can do this in two ways. Uh, I was going to put this first, sorry. So the first way is what I said, uh, is the difference frequency generation. So when delta omega is much larger than tau minus one, which means you're shining light, or say two beams with a beating that is much faster than tau, okay? So if the beating is much faster, then you can resolve cosine versus sine, and then you can tell what is the injection and what is the shift, and there is no influence of tau. Then it's when it's really quiet. A related option that I haven't mentioned so far, but which is really the same, is instead of doing this beating, you just shine one pulse. And this pulse is again much shorter than tau. What happens in that case is, you will believe me, instead of uh, sine and cosine, what you get is the shape of the pulse and the derivative of the shape. And you can tell the effect apart by just looking at the shape of the response. So here you shine cosine and you get sine and cosine. Here you shine whatever else. You get this or the derivative of this, and you can tell these two things. In both cases, you need to be in the fast regime where everything happens before you saturate. Okay, and then tau doesn't matter. So that's one thing that you need to achieve. And then the other thing is you need the right window of frequencies. Okay, so I was saying you need to be in between the chemical potentials of the left and right nodes, so that Pauli blocking only blocks one node and not the other. Tau should also be, you know, uh, almost near zero in the frequency scale. So this was delta omega, this is omega. This is usually not a problem uh, in, in this energy scale. The problem is more the frequency here, because if you have, now this is the band structure of the multifold, and I want to do transitions here. I also have a band somewhere here. So there will be corrections in omega over this energy scale. So I put it here, and you have to be below that, okay? And in addition, this is only for multifolds. If you're doing multifolds, there is also the quadratic corrections. I just said that this only works for linear models, but the multifolds are not linear. They do whatever in the Brillouin zone. So it's only linear around the node. And so the quadratic corrections give you an energy scale if you have some effective mass uh, from the bending. So M star VF squared is an energy. And you also get corrections with these energy scales. So frequency has to be much smaller than this. And actually, for multifolds, this is going to be the critical, uh, the critical <coughs> drawback because this, you can estimate this for this particular band structure. I think it's about 0.5 electron volts, so 500 MeV. Uh, so that's already, you know, the Pauli block in here happens at maybe 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. But if this energy scale is much lower, then this doesn't really matter. What kills the quantization is this. Okay. So there's, you know, there's a number of things that you need to make work uh, properly so that this uh, really happens. And in particular, because this is an extra drawback of multifolds, uh, I would say it's still worth to keep looking for standard chiral bytes that don't have this problem. Okay? Where the only problem is really the chemical potentials and that there are no other bands around. Something like strontium disilidride or, or something. Okay? I think it's still worth looking for. Uh, so, so far, I mean, you've, you've seen this uh, experiment already. I think we'll uh, also have more details in the next talk. But the only thing that is available so far is this experiment in rhodium silicon, where uh, they have measured the circular photogalvanic effect. And, well, it has this noise here, but it's in principle close to four. It dies out where it should once the R point becomes active. Uh, you know, there's besides this noise here, there's also a few things in the way they, they did the theory. That, for this paper that aren't quite right. So I think this is, you know, it, it's a nice first experiment that is showing that this can be done. I think that the, the matching to the theory probably can be done better. But let's keep in mind that because of the quadratic corrections, this isn't really quantized, properly quantized at any energy, okay? So we asked Yang Tsang from Dresden, now at MIT, to uh, do an ab initial calculation for us. And uh, this is what happens in the absence of string orbit. So this is a finite broadening, the calculation. So you see this, this step has some uh, finite width. And there is also some uh, residual. Uh, it's here at two minutes. OK. Uh, that, that's good. I think I'll finish uh, a couple of minutes. So uh, yeah, so 
this isn't exactly quantized, so I can experiment will introduce other errors, so this is still good enough, but you know, we have to probably keep looking for something better. And so in the last slide, I, uh, in the last couple of minutes, let me mention this new uh, free carrier contribution that we worked out uh, by. So what I was doing is let's just do redo the theory for the full nonlinear response in general, as it's done in all of these papers. This has also been mentioned before. Uh, so you just uh, want to redo this semiconductor theory for metals, assuming that now there is a Fermi surface. So the Fermi surface has an uh, F, a Fermi function that depends on K at the Fermi surface. And so uh, this introduces a few changes in these derivations, but they are easy to keep track of. So you just do the same thing. Uh, it's a bit subtle, but it can be done. And what you find in the end is that in addition to the injection current and the shift current, there is a new piece uh, that contributes to the circular photogalvanic effect. But it's only there for the Fermi surface. And it's circular, but it goes with the cosine. Okay? So it's more like this one, but it's circular in it. So, <clears throat> The, the very dipole that Inti was uh, talking about as a circular contribution that's in here, for example. Okay? So this is a Fermi surface piece. But what we found by doing this calculation uh, you know, to the end is that there are actually contributions beyond the very dipole. So very dipole is here. This is the very curvature. Uh, and uh, there is also this uh, semi-classical piece. So this, uh, the one that had three derivatives in, in Inti's talk, if you put integrate by parts and put this derivative here. But there is also this new piece that has an energy denominator. And uh, this is not semi-classical, this is not, not a semi-classical origin, but it's still there. And because it has this energy denominator, it's going to give spikes in the circular photogalvanic effect. And this had been missed before, or at least, I mean, we didn't know of it before. But uh, this formula was actually derived in Genkin and Metnis in 68. In this paper with this uh, very suggestive type of right? nonlinear effects with partially filled by. And uh, I found this paper only after doing the derivation, but uh, here it is. So Barry Dipole, if you want, was already anticipated in 68. In the field. Uh, and so I'm not going to go into the details of how this is derived, but let me just point out that there is a very close connection between this free carrier difference frequency generation and the linear polarizability. In fact, you can see these two equations are almost exactly the same. If you take the reactive part, which is this, uh, the only thing that changes from the reactive linear polarizability to this is that I switch f by the derivative of that. That gives me one more index, so this has three indices now, but everything else is the same. So for every piece in linear polarizability, there is a free carrier uh, photocurrent. For example, the anomalous Hall effect gives you very dipole, the Drude peak gives you this semi-classical guy, and the interband piece gives you this, uh, this new spiky computer. So these are my... Uh, Results. Again, this is Jan Sang doing the prediction. This is the one I showed before. This is the prediction for rhodium silicon or cantalo marginite. You can see these spikes at the places where you get uh, the onset of new transitions. And so one should really take this into account when interpreting circular photovoltaic experiments. And since I think I'm out of time, let me just uh, thank my collaborators in this uh, project and also discussion with uh, uh, other people who subject, in particular Ivo and Inti Soderman, Bing Hai, Lian Wu, and uh, Nils here in the audience, and uh, yeah, the collaborators, Rob uh, Grusin, Joel Moore, and Takahiro, uh, Berkeley, Barry, and Felix Blicker was at Oxford, Maya in Spain, San Sebastian, and Nils and Nils. And so with this, I'll finish and take questions. John, thank you very much. The next person should set up. Okay, so we have time for maybe one question. I have one quick thing to point out. This material that Barry talked about earlier, this tantalum, uh, this wild CDW, oh, yeah. it's chiral. Right. So the high temperature phase has lots of wild points everywhere. So you might want to look at that. I mean, there's lots of wild points, and like if they're very narrowly separated, but uh, but it is a conventional well so Right, right. It's in a chiral uh, there are no other, you know. I, the, the thing is that the band structure looked really nice in the high symmetry lines, but what Barry was telling me is that there's a bunch of other stuff. There's like almost 50 wild points right. all so throughout the bronze zone. If you have bands on top or below, then that, you know, it's good. But yeah, 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 it's worth looking at. But it is an example, at least. Another potential example could be if you look at, if you took one of the multifold fermions and then apply the symmetry breaking field to like split a spin one vial into like two 
you know, when you split them, the chirality still has to be there. So you know it will split into two vials. Maybe this could be a way to engineer the vial points that you're looking for. It's already chiral. Maybe. Start it's already chiral. The, you know, the dispersion one might have a lot of yeah, remnants of being non-linear. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Let's thank the speaker again.